you have a Bible, take it please and turn to the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 1. We're doing a series on our Sunday mornings in the minor prophets called the Twelve. We're looking at the Twelve Minor Prophets, but especially focusing our time right now on the book of Jonah. And I love this book. We've moved rather briskly through several of the uh, uh, minor prophets, but the book of Jonah, we're kind of slowing it down, moving at a little uh, slower of a pace. Uh, I mentioned to you last week, but if you weren't here, uh, I want to just kind of restate, restate this. Most of these prophets, remember, these were the people that God spoke to, and then they spoke to the nations. And most of them had like, God gave them a message, and then they spoke it to the people. So I think of like Amos, who was a, a shepherd, but then God called him to go to the nation of Israel and to speak uh, messages to the people. Well, Amos was not a prophet, but God used him in that way. Now, Jonah, on the other hand, was a prophet. And he's already made prophecies before, and we see them in other books of the Bible. But now is his story. And his story is the book. There's not like this, like, oh, a message to one nation in particular, uh, very strong. In fact, there's one preaching message there's one preaching message in the book of Jonah. It's one of the worst preaching messages you'll ever hear in your life. It's a fantastic. We'll look at it in, I don't know, whenever we get to it. But it's, it's five words long. Basically, Jonah, I can't do it justice in English, but it's just this. You're all going to hell, peace out. And then he walks off. That's the whole message. And the whole city repents. It's the worst message you'll ever hear, but it, like, worked. So we'll talk about it when we get there, not the time. We're at the very beginning of the book of Jonah, and we just looked at the first three verses, and normally, like I said, I'm not one to go too slow, but we're going to do it again. We're going to look at the first six verses today, because all of it is, it's so powerful and so important. So I want to read to you, beginning in Jonah 1, that was as long as I could do to get you time to open the book of Jonah. Hopefully you got it. Jonah chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, the verses will be on the screen, beginning in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. And the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him, and he said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. These are the verses that I'd like to focus our attention on today. So let's start with this, because we're going to be talking about a particular theme here in Jonah. Let's start with this. Who are my runners? Who likes to run? Or who runs? Who hates running but runs? Anyways, any runners in here? A few of you. A few of you. Do you run just because you want to eat? I run to eat. Anybody else run to eat? You run to eat? Okay, I have a friend, Joy and I have a very, very close friend. Uh, her name is Sally, and she's an ultra marathon runner. Do you know what an ultra marathon? Like, marathon runners are dumb. She's an ultra marathon. She, she just took third, she's a pro, she does this for Nike, uh, otherwise you couldn't do this, but she, she, uh, she just ran, it's called the Badwater 135. Anybody heard of that? It's the stupidest race on, on the planet. It's a, she ran 135 miles. She was the fastest woman to do it. She took third place for both men and women. First among the women. She's nuts. She's, she's ridiculous. A hundred, at 135, anybody want to run 135? No. Who wants to watch that race either? That's like the most boring thing in the world. It's like, oh, look at, they're still going, you know. Uh, but she's amazing. And she loves to run. And she loves to coach people on how to run. And our story today is about a runner. Jonah. 
But he's not running, uh, you know, a Badwater 135. He's not even running a 5K. This dude's running from God. And he's going to do a terrible job of it. But we're going to talk today about what does it look like to run from God. Now, some things that we already talked about last week in the introduction that I gave you to this book was that just for like the sake of geography, Nineveh was, let's just, let's just keep it really simple, Nineveh was in to my right, your left. And so when God said, I want you to go to Nineveh, Jonah, we read, it says that he, and by the way, if you noticed it in those verses when I was reading it, it says over and over, Tarshish, Tarshish, Tarshish. It's because if you knew the geography, you'd know God says to go this way to Nineveh, and, and Jonah's like, okay, cool, God, thanks. And he goes this way, my left, your right, to Tarshish. He went in the exact opposite direction possible from where God told him to go. God said, I want you to go in one direction, and Jonah said, I'm going to go in the exact opposite direction. He is running from God. And this is a a storied version of the message of the gospel that we're going to see over and over and over in the book of Jonah. A reminder that there is no one, there is no one who is more kind and more loving than God. Not one human being. I don't care what their beliefs, what their views, who they are. No one is kinder and more gracious and more loving than God is. And this book reminds us that it doesn't matter what, where you're coming from, God will beat you in being gracious. And that not only includes Ninevites who are terrible human beings, by the way, and these sailors who were just, you know, pagan sailors, But it also includes a love and a grace for Jonah himself. And we're going to look at what that means and what that takes. Most of the story of the book of Jonah. Now, by the way, we should do this. Who wrote the book of Jonah? Jonah. Again, if you were writing your story, you would look amazing. Guys, you'd be at least six feet tall. My hair would be black, you know, and muscly and all those kinds of things, right? You would tell your story in a way that makes you look at least kind of good. Jonah, on the other hand, takes a very different approach in this book. Instead of Jonah describing all of the exploits of how great he was, he takes a very raw and a very real approach of saying, this is what I felt, this is what I did, this is what I thought, and I was wrong. And this is who God is and how he responded, not only to the Ninevites and to the sailors, but to me. You see, in every religious person and non-religious person is a Pharisee. What is a Pharisee? A self-righteous human being. We all find place for self-righteousness. I am certainly better than somebody else on this planet. And, and it's in us. Now, we don't want that. We don't, we don't want to encourage that. We don't, we don't even really, in, in, in the front of our mind, we don't believe it. But in the back of our mind, we do. It exists that, that I'm a little bit better. And that if they knew, if they were more like me, and that's the book, that's what Jonah wrestled with so much here, is that if people were more like him, he felt the world would be a better place. And the story of Jonah is God saying, dude, we barely need one of you. You are not as great as you think you are, but it didn't stop God from doing great things. I want to, I told you I want to talk about running, running from God, and I want to do this in like a three three ways. I want you to see running from three perspectives here. We're going to talk about the attitude of running, the process of running, and then the cost of running. Number one, I want to talk about the attitude of running from God. In verse 3, notice it says that right after God called Jonah, it says that he fled from the presence of the Lord. Quite literally, in like less English, more of the original languages, it says that he, he, he defied the living God. He moved exactly away 
from the living God. It was claiming that my way in this situation is better. I know better than you do, God. You're wrong about what you're wanting. You're wrong about what you want to do. And I know better. Now, the Bible uses another word for this that has been misabused and misapplied, but is still appropriate and still relevant for today. It's the word sin. It's either been harped on to people where they feel like, you know, they feel beaten down, or it's been misapplied as if there is no such thing. But the reality is this. Sin simply is not meeting the standard of perfection. And you might say that's not a fair standard because nobody could meet it. And to that I would say, ding, 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 ding. You win the prize. That's a very point of of what the Bible describes sin is. It's not I was doing good based on the curve of of human standards, but rather God created a standard. I'm not able to live up to that. There's a reason why God became one of us. Otherwise, why would Jesus ever become one of us and die for us if it wasn't to deal with the problem that plagues every human being, past, present, future, sin? Now, Jonah is an interesting example of this because, you see, he's a prophet. He's a man of God, quote, unquote. He's supposed to know these things. He's had God's word. He's even expressed God's heart to the nation. It's just that what God was asking Jonah to do was outside of the purview of Jonah's idea of God's love. And that's going to happen to all of us at one point in our life. That we're going to be hit by the wall of, I don't believe that God actually loves beyond, like if I can't love that person, I don't know if God can. And friends, Jonah hit the wall. Jonah got slapped by the wall several times. And he learned that God's love and God's idea of graciousness far, far outweighs anything we could ever do. And so this is why we need to, you know, when we talk about sin, it's not this thing of like, you're bad. It's not why the Bible describes sin. It's that it separates us from a living God. And there's nothing worse than to be separated from a God who made you, who offered his life for you. There's nothing worse than to be separated from that God. Human existence will not sustain itself for eternity apart from a relationship with the living God. It's not possible. And yet in the temporary, so few are understanding this. So why is sin in this context so destructive? It's because it's making an idol of myself. I want you to see this from the book of Jonah. God said, go to Nineveh. And Jonah's like, I'm smarter than you. I know what I'm doing and you're wrong. I'm going to Tarshish. Jonah didn't say any of those words, by the way. I mean, there's very few people that are like, God, you're dumb. I'm smart and I know better. It's not expressed in words, it's expressed in actual actions. I know tons of people, in fact, the book of James even says this, you say you believe in God, good for you, even demons believe in God. Words do not express a living faith in God, actions do. And Jonah's actions showed that he didn't actually believe God. He knew better than God. And that ultimately, when you think of like sin, stop thinking of just like, you know, evil and gross and terrible. It is a rebellion against a living God who knows better than you and me. It's a form of idolatry. How does any of this relate to the book of Jonah? Throughout the book, we're going to learn that Jonah does not run from the Ninevites because he's afraid of failure. You're going to learn this. Jonah was not afraid of the Ninevites. But let me just stop and say something. He should have been. He should have been. He should have been very afraid of them. The region that Nineveh was in today, that same, that we would, we would call that region today, it's called today, the region of, it's the city of Mosul. We've all heard of Mosul. It's been on the news for years past. It was one of the provincial headquarters for that terrorist organization, ISIS. And so think about Nineveh kind of in that context a bit. If Jonah was afraid to go to Nineveh because they will, they were like, they were the perfectors of some of the worst forms of execution that we still have today. If it was an art, they were artists. They was a, it was a terrifying, terrifying group of people. 
But all that said, you ready? It's not why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Jonah was not, and I'm going to show this to you over and over and over in the book of Jonah. Jonah was not afraid of failure or death or any of those things. You know what Jonah feared the most? Success. Jonah was afraid that if he did what God wanted him to do, the Ninevites would repent and God would be gracious and that would be the worst possible thing. Talk about something being wrong in your heart when the worst possible scenario is God being gracious to a whole bunch of people. But imagine hating some group of people or some person or some issue so much that even when God says, I want to love them through you, your response was, no. That's the book of Jonah. And if Jonah wanted to hate them, I would have understood out of fear, but that's not what's going to happen here. And we will see it as we get into it. The attitude of running is this. I know better than God. I know better than what his word tells me to do. I know that God is going to do something and I don't want him to do that. And so God sends a storm. And once again, I want you to reorientate your mind around why God sent the storm. Maybe you've heard it said that it was like punishment to Jonah. I know that's how most people see tragedies around them. We immediately, you know, you hear it on the news, you see it in social media contexts, like, God, like there's some kind of like God is punishing people when some, you know, tsunami or some earthquake or something like that, and nothing could be further from the truth. And I can prove it just so, it's so easy to prove. In the book of Romans chapter 5, we're told that all of the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus when he was on the cross. Either that's true or it's not. If all of God's wrath was poured out on Jesus, there is no more wrath. God has no more wrath for humanity today. It was, it was consumed by God who became one of us, so that he could love and forgive and, yes, convict and draw and do all the things necessary to get us to a place where we'll see our need for him. But here's the thing. That storm, that tragedy, that difficulty, I don't have answers for the why, but I do know one of the whys. It was not because God is angry and wrathful and full of vengeance and wanting to get back at you. That I know. All the other things you're going to have to discover, God's going to have to show you, or one day in heaven you'll, you'll, you'll get the answers. But what I do know is that when we see tragedies happen around the world, they are not the cause of an angry God. We live, again, we live in a world that has fallen. That's the reality. Bad things happen. And God sent a storm, listen to this, God sent a storm into Jonah's life, not because uh, he was punishing Jonah, quite the opposite. It's because he was drawing Jonah. He was going to draw Jonah in, into a new relationship, into a new, it's kind of like, you know, we, I hear the phrase today like, you know, oh, this person's not doing good, we need to have an intervention. This is how God has interventions, okay? Big old storms on seas. And the Bible makes it clear that in Jonah's life, bondage, bondage was running in the opposite direction of God. Real bondage is self-reliance and self-dependence because, listen, when things are going good and you rely upon yourself, everything's fine. You got this. But when things stop going good and you've been relying on yourself, then you better make it okay. But you, have to, you have to fix it. But what if there's a better way? What if there actually is a God who wants to help you not have to rely upon yourself, but to allow you to trust in him? When you choose to believe in God, you are setting yourself free from the bondage of idolatry, that I can do it, I can make it happen, I can fix it, I can, and, 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 and I've used the example so many different times, it's like you see a problem in your life, and so you, you, you see the hole that's missing, and you, you dig a hole, and you dig, you dig, you dig, and you cover it up, and you stamp it in, you're like, okay, good, it's all better. And then you go, oh, wow, there's another hole. Okay, hold on, I can fix that. And then you dig and you cover that one up. And then and eventually your life is just surrounded by a bunch of, 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 of holes that you've been trying to fix all by yourself. And you will find yourself isolated, 
alone, you're trapped, you can't even move anymore. Friends, there's a better way. Trusting in the Lord. It's the opposite of the idolatry of believing I can fix everything on my own. Real freedom. Because the attitude of running says, I can do it. But real freedom says, I'm going to trust in a living God who cares for me. I want to talk about the process of running. And I want to read uh, a a couple of the verses we've already read. Verse 3, Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of God. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, paid the fare, went into it, and uh, and to go away from the presence of God. Verse 5, the mariners were afraid, and they all cried out to their God, and they threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down to the lowest parts of the ship and was fast asleep. I, there's there's, a, there's a, um, a phrasing that happens over and over in these verses, and it's in both our languaging, uh, in our English language, or if you're reading in Spanish or whatever, um, but also in the original language. He went down to Joppa. He was going down to Joppa. He was going down somewhere. He went down into the boat. There's this commonality over and over and over trying to get us to hear the phrasing that when Jonah ran from God, the process of running of God, from God takes you downward. It takes you down from where you were at. You were here and God was working in your life and there was trials and there was difficulties, but you were trusting in the Lord. But when you choose to trust in yourself, when you move away from the presence of God, then you're moving downward. You're never moving upward. Now, now, things might go better. I can't tell you how many Christians I've talked to who, when they first get saved, they give their life to Jesus and then everything goes wrong. Every, and they're like, man, it was easier when I wasn't a Christian. That's just a perspective that you have based on how things are going in that moment of your life. But the reality is we don't move upward when we move away from God. You might make more money, but you won't have more peace. You might have more security in a temporal sense, but you won't have more lasting sense of value and purpose. It'll be fleeting. It's always going downward. That is the process of running from God. It always leads downward. And it eventually culminates, and it's interesting because in this context, Jonah goes down into the boat and he falls fast asleep. Why? Exhaustion. From what? Worry. When you are responsible for fixing it all on yourself, you will never experience a refreshed day of your life. When you've got to always make it happen, You will always be exhausted. It is exhausting trying to keep all the, you know, I wish I could show you an example, do it, you know, I wish I could have somebody up here spinning all the plates. You know, you've seen those people do that? You used to see them all the time in Budapest on the streets. You'd see them, you know, and everybody would be like, oh, wow, you know, tourists loved it. Oh, it's so cool, you know, and, and they could just keep them spinning and keep them spinning and keep them spinning. I guarantee you, we can't do that as well as they could on the streets for a gimmick in our lives. You can't keep all the plates of your life going. They will start crashing down. And that's not me trying to like be the bummer guy. It's to say you weren't meant to keep plates spinning. What if that wasn't what you were made for? What if you weren't made, like if you're spinning the plates, if God just said, just stop it. Because he doesn't want to spin the plates for you either. He wants to get you out of that whole thing. He wants to do a new paradigm in each one of our lives. Running from God always leads to the exhaustion of having to keep things going on your own. You'll always be exhausted. You'll always be worn down. The reason so many people don't realize that they're running from God is because ultimately they're asleep now. So dulled to the voice of God. So dulled to the idea that God loves them. So dulled, so, so dulled by the fact that they can say, well, I'm better than those Christians, so what's the point of that? Friends, if you're looking to compare yourself to make yourself feel better by looking at other Christians, you'll always win. Because we might be one of the only groups that truly believes in a self-reflective nature where we'll take it. You want to tell me that I'm lame? I'll agree with you. And I'll give you eight more reasons why I'm lamer than you even imagine. The reason that we'll do that is because we... We believe we need God. The criticism of the world that says, hey, you Christians aren't any better than us. And I would answer, I totally agree with you. We're not. The very thought that you thought that we thought we were is the problem. We're not better than anybody. 
We believe that we have a God who loves the whole world, who is better than all of us, and wants a relationship with us. But the idea that we are fundamentally better human beings just isn't true. And slumber occurs to so many who have been running from God, and they dull themselves with whatever it might be. It's, it's the need for entertainment. It's the need for busyness in their work. It's the need to make the idol out of a family, or whatever it might be. These things can dull us to the voice of God and to the presence of God. It's kind of like this idea of a rising tide, which we can all understand. This idea that, that the tides will rise, they will ebb and flow. But, you know, uh, you know uh, Friday, or yesterday, Carlos and I went surfing, and we were in Pacific Beach, and it was quite a move of the, the waves were really moving in a direction. And so we started at one point, you all have seen this happen, you've experienced it at the beach. You start at one point, and by the time we're done, we're, we're hoofing it back to the car because we had moved. And you just don't pay attention, you don't even think about it, but the tide, just, it just moves you along, the current just moves you. And I want you to think of that's what happens, that's the process of running from God. Not this overt, you're going in the wrong direction, but this just slow movement of a current that takes you away from where God wants you to be. And it happens so subtly. I mean, if you were to ask Jonah, hey Jonah, do you want a book of the Bible to be dedicated to how dumb you were? And then Jonah says, well, do I have a choice? Yeah, if you could choose, would you like every Christian and many non-Christians to read a book about what an idiot you were or not? Which one would you choose? He would say, oh, I don't want that. Do you want to be swallowed by a great fish? Mm, no, nah, I'll skip that. Do you want to be a public face of a person that runs from God even though you should have known better? No, I don't want to be that person. You ask somebody who struggled with alcoholism, did you want to be an alcoholic? Come on, they're going to say, of course not. Did you want those things? Of course not. But it's the current. It doesn't happen just like that. It's that slow movement, that dullness that comes, that sleep that comes over us. I'm no longer, I'm no longer listening, no longer hearing, no longer interested, and I'm just moving, 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 moving away. And then if we're lucky... One day we wake up and we realize, oh my gosh, look at how far I've come. My life might be good, things are going well, but look at how far I've gone from, from a, a, a God who, who does love me. The process of running is not one day you go from like, oh, I'm so into, I love God, I'm so into God, and the next day it's like, I hate God and I don't want anything to do that. No, it's a slow-moving process where you and I, it's like those, like that hypnotism thing, you know, where you just like, tick, tick tick, and then one day you're just out, and you stop. You stop experiencing the voice of God through the scriptures, the connection of other people to, to you know, to, to be a part of your life. You just stop. You stop hearing from God. You stop expecting to hear from God. It's the slow sleep that comes over all of our lives if we don't stay engaged in our relationship with God. Last one, the cost of running. It'd be easy to say that if you run from God, he'll make your life miserable. That's definitely Jonah's story, but that's not the message. It's not the message at all. This is the message. Jonah was already miserable. He made his own life miserable. Everything that he was, his whole calling, his whole relationship with God, everything, his community, everything was going to be gone because he was not willing to listen and obey God. Just think of that. He was going to give it all up. Some people talk about the cost of sacrifice. You know, oh, it's such a sacrifice to become a Christian because you might lose some friends and some things. Da, 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 da. Friends, the opposite is also true. The cost of rejecting Jesus is far higher. It costs you so much more. It's, it's, an, it's a, such an irony. And, and it's such an irony that when I'm not doing good, my first inclination is, oh, I, I don't want to be around other Christians because I'm not doing really good. When that's exactly what I need. Oh, I'm not doing that great, so I should. There's something inside of us, and you have to see this. When there's something not going right, our inclination is isolation. Friends, something's wrong in that. Many people choose to live that way 
But it's not what God wants for you and for me. There is, however, prices that we all pay when we just give in to that. And that's the price that Jonah was paying. Jonah's life was miserable. And you're like, yeah, but at least he was asleep. Yeah, but he was asleep in a boat with a bunch of dudes he didn't know going in the direction he wasn't supposed to go in from a God that he was supposed to be speaking about. It's a problem. He was not not only was he not happy, but his life was in... This was not the sleep of somebody who's like, oh, life has been so good, let's go to bed. There's a verse in Isaiah that says he'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on him. And we always read that to our kids to make him go to bed. Doesn't work, does it? I don't think. But this idea that when you are in God's will, you can experience a kind of peace that allows you to have God's rest. But Jonah didn't have that. Jonah's sleep was not because he was at rest. It was because he was so exhausted, he finally just passed out. That's the cost. The other cost is this. Everybody in that boat had to suffer from Jonah's decision-making. In fact, let's take it a little bit further. Everybody who was on the sea that day, every boat that was on the sea suffered because Jonah chose to move away from God. Just think about that. It wasn't like there was a storm happening. It was like one boat and everybody else was like, wow, that's weird. It was hitting the whole sea. Everybody was struggling. Everybody was, why? Because one person chose to run from God. And is this my way of trying to guilt you into a, a, a deeper relationship with God? Not at all. It's simply to point out, this is what happens to every single one of us. This is the result. It's not the, don't, don't walk out of here like, oh, I'm just supposed to feel bad. No, 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 no. This is the result when we move away from God. It's that it impacts the people around us. Sometimes you might say, well, I think it's been better for them. Then there was something wrong with the brand of Christianity you were working under. See, the reality is, is that when I move away from God, my family suffers. It's true for you as well. Your kids suffer, your spouse. Our rebellion hurts those around us. C.S. Lewis talks about this in this book called The Great Divorce, an amazing book. C.S. Lewis was a philosopher at, I believe, Oxford, either Oxford or Cambridge. I always mix them up, him and uh, Lord of the Rings dude. So. Uh, he makes the case that... Uh, this is the case that he makes. He makes the case that, that for those who run from God, he calls it this. He calls them the see-through people. You become less of who you are when you run from God. And those who run towards God become more substantive of who they were made and saved to be. In other words, the further we move away from God, the, more less, the, the, the less we become of who God made us to be. The less human you become to who you were made to be. You become a striking image of everybody else that's out there. Not unique to who God made you to be. But when you run towards the Lord, when you move towards God, you become more human, more of who you and I were made to be. The point is this, those who run from God become less of who God made them to be. Those who run towards God become more who they were made to be. You guys, uh, you guys all heard, I mean, uh, if maybe you haven't been flying, most of us haven't been flying a lot in the last uh, couple of years, but you get, you know, you remember the thing when you get on or, you know, when they're doing their little speech, you know, put your seatbelt on and all and the oxygen thing comes down and what do they tell you to do? If you're traveling with children, what do you do? Put yours on first, right? And then help your kid. And I remember so clearly being a kid on that and thinking, well, that stinks. It's like second class flyers, you know? And then I'm thinking, you know, there's a lot of us in my family. Who knows when I'll get my oxygen mask on? I mean, <laughs> and some of you guys, you know, you guys got some big kids, big families over there. It's like, dang, I could be six of this, you know? Who knows how long before I'll be breathing again normally? It's easy to think this way, right? It's easy to think this way in life. It's easy to imagine, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, I, 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 I'm going to be left out. I'm, 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 I don't matter as much. I'm not, as, you know, I'm not being concerned or, or considered as much as others are being considered. As a parent, I totally get it. I'm no good to my kids if I'm not breathing. The whole idea makes a lot of sense. So I want to ask you, are you breathing? Are you breathing? 
Not the oxygen we're all inhaling right now, but the oxygen of the presence of God. Are you breathing? Do you have life? Are you running from or are you running towards God? Are you inhaling of, of, of a God who actually cares? Friends, I'm convinced that if we could get who Jesus really is out to the world, it will transform the whole world. If we can get rid of the false concepts that exist around who God is, God will change the whole world. As a parent, I, I, I think as a kid, I'm like, hey, let's just start with mine. That would be better. As a parent, I get it. you gotta, you got to be breathing first. And I'm saying this to you as parents, as people who have friends and coworkers who need Christ. Are you breathing? Make sure that you're breathing in from who God is. And I want to I finish, and I, I'm going to do this kind of every single week. I want to I wanna do this contrast. I try to do this each week. We did this last week as well. I want to do this contrast with you. You know, last week we saw Jonah rebelling against God, and then we saw in Jesus one who was obeying the voice of his father. And here I want you to see the same thing happening. You see, there was one who ran, Jonah. Jonah runs from God. But in Jesus, we read about one who came and who ran towards God, towards the will of God, in the face of hell and the devil and pain, I mean real pain, and emotional and psychological pain, and total isolation, and the wrath of God being poured out on him, Jesus still ran towards his father, not away from his father. The process of running from God is painful. And the process of running to God is painful. It's not easy. The results are so different. The results are so different. Jesus ran towards his father and the result in his life and for every single one of us was eternal life. You know, it's interesting and I'll wrap up with this same story. It's interesting because in the gospels we read about a time when Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and they were to sail to the other side and as they were going to the other side a giant storm arose on the sea and the disciples started freaking out and remember they're fishermen, they're really good on the water but they're convinced they're going to die and they look at the front of the boat and guess what? Jesus, it says the same thing, was fast asleep. He was fast asleep. But not like Jonah. Jonah was fast asleep because he had expended himself of every bit of energy he's ever had, and he was just dead to the world. He lost all peace, all hope, all sense of anything, and he was just out cold. Jesus was asleep, but not with the sleep of exhaustion, but that real rest that only God can give. And the disciples came to Jesus and they woke him up and they're like, don't you care that we're going to die? And it's the weirdest thing that you would say to somebody when you wake them up, first of all. Don't ever wake somebody up like that. But they wake Jesus up with, don't you care that we're going to die? The message of the book of Jonah and the message of this story in the life of Jesus is exactly the same. It's this. There has always been a God who you never have to wonder if he cares for you. He cares for you. There's nothing you're going to do that's going to make him stop caring for you. Nothing you've thought, nothing you'll say, nothing you've done, nothing will stop you from the love of God. Except you. And your own decision, which God gave to you to say, I don't want you and I don't need you. That, that's the ultimate rebellion. Jesus slept because he was at peace. Jonah slept because he was just exhausted trying to save himself. And when the disciples said, don't you care? I love that Jesus doesn't answer their question. He's like, well, yes, yeah, sit down, guys, and let me explain to you how much I care for you. He just walked right by them on the boat, stood up, and he looked at all the waves, and he said, stop. Now, the English is like cute, peace, be still. But original... Just stop it. 
And what he couldn't do for the disciples, he did for the waves. He couldn't, you can't stop the heart of man from that fear, but the waves stopped immediately. And then Jesus turned and he addressed his disciples. And I would encourage you, and we'll close in a song of praise. Don't run from God, run to him. And I'm not talking about whether, you know, oh, my whole life I've been running from God. I'm talking, if you're a Christian, you've been a Christian for 50 years, where have you been running from God? And where could you turn back to him? If you've never put your faith in Jesus, I'm begging you, stop running from and start running to him. Because he loves you. If you've never known that before, know it now. He loves you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the chance to be in your word like this. And I pray that you would you'd be very present in each one of our lives, Lord. I pray that we would learn the importance of not running from, but running to. That there's a cost, but that you're bigger than all these things. And I want to pray, Jesus, for those that are, are still struggling to, to, to figure out, do they want to run to you? Do they want to trust you with their life? I want to beg you today and encourage you today, and I'd like to even pray for you today before we, before we worship. Make a decision today to say, I want to run to the Lord and not from him anymore. And if that's something that you want to do and you want prayer for that, it, it's not a, a, an end-all salvation, you know, like, one thing does it all, but that you would begin a relationship with God or you would begin a fresh start of running towards him. Maybe you've been spending too much time avoiding and God wants you to start moving towards him. If that is you and you want to start moving towards God in fresh ways in your life, then I want you to raise your hand and I'm going to pray for you before we worship. That's awesome. It's great. Wonderful. It's great. It's great. Father, for those that have raised their hands, I, I, I'm, I'm praying for them right now that you would, you would put peace into their hearts in ways they haven't experienced in a long time. Lord, your, your word tells us that you could give us a peace that passes understanding so the circumstances of their lives might be such that any peace won't make sense. That's the peace I'm praying for in their life. Give them, do something in their heart, God, that doesn't make outward sense, but that they inwardly experience. I pray for grace upon them. I pray that, God, they would know today, this week, the joy of stopping running from you and starting running towards you. I'm thankful, Lord, that there's such a great group of people that are ready to, to go deeper. Just may that be true for each one of their lives, Lord. And, Lord, may that be true of each one of us, that we would have a deeper relationship with Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us, whether online or in person. We pray that the ministry of Calvary San Diego is encouraging you in your faith. If you would like to follow along with what we are doing or hear more teachings, you can do so by downloading the Calvary SD mobile or TV app. Also, if you would like to partner with us and worship through giving, you can do so at calvarysd.com give. Thanks for tuning in.